afternoon it is 12 30 and i'd like to call to order the meeting of the uh, winston-salem forsyth county utilities commission for july the 11th 2022 i felt loud that time huh? yeah. <laughs> that's great at this time uh miss groove roll call okay uh chair wesley Curtis. present commissioner harold eustache commissioner tom griffin commissioner yvonne hines here Commissioner Hugh Jernigan. Here. Commissioner Dwayne Long. Present. Commissioner Chris Parker. Present. Commissioner Charles Wilson. Present. Commissioner Alan Younger. Present. Great. Uh, I'd like to, uh, we've, got a, we've got a couple of visitors with us today and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Courtney. She's going to, uh, yeah, Courtney, she's going to talk about those visitors. We're glad to have them visiting with. I had a chance to have to talk with a few of the interns, but not 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 all. Um, so Courtney, you yeah, know? yeah, perfect. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. I have I do have a couple of announcements, and um, also want to introduce mm -hmm. Janice, who's part of our uh, budget office. She's our budget analyst, so she's new to the city. What? A month or so? Yeah. Two months or so. Yeah. yeah. So she'll be with us uh, going forward, but she's our budget analyst, came to us from the county. So we're glad to have her. And then um, we do have three engineering students, and I'll just let the three of y'all stand up. Um, two of them are actually our summer interns. They're going through the summer internship program. And then one um, is actually just shadowing. Um, so anyway, we have Elijah Birch, who is from High Point and is a junior at UNC Charlotte with a major in civil engineering and is planning to get into local government after graduation, probably in the water or sewer sector. So that's exciting. Yeah, it is. And then Caroline Bliss is from Davie County. She's a sophomore at NC State. She's planning on studying either industrial or civil engineering and hopes to go into consulting or something with construction after graduation, unless we can convince her into going to the government, go. government sector and join us. So um, we're glad to have them. They're part of the internship program that um, spends some time with four public works departments. So it's a, it's a good uh, internship. And Maddie Burgess is here and she's not part of the internship um, program this year, but maybe uh, in future years, but she has had the opportunity to shadow at SWAN, our SWAN water treatment plant with the chemist. And then she's here with us today. And she lives in Louisville, uh, graduate of Reagan High School. She's a rising sophomore at UNC Charlotte, pursuing a degree in environmental science and a major, a minor, I'm sorry, in chemistry. And she has a passion in energy conservation and water treatment. So a lot of, um, a lot of exciting things for these students, a lot of good opportunities for them. So anyway, you, thanks did, for being here. Did you give them an application just to? Just <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, we are, we are hiring, so keep us in mind when you, when you graduate, right? Okay, well, thank you for, for joining yeah, us thank, today. Thanks for joining us. Okay, I'm going to um, go ahead and share my screen. Go into the other. This is always okay, there we go. Okay, so um, a couple other welcome announcements, then we'll get through, get to the uh, treatment plant updates. Bill's going to go over that. We also are going to give you an update on PF, um, PFAS, which is called, you'll maybe hear it referred to as the Forever Chemicals. It's been in the media. And the EPA has set some new health advisory limits. So Bill's going to update you on that. Then uh, Mike Stover will go over the field operations update, Jan, the solid waste updates, and we'll get to the agenda item. And Shane will um, update you on our capital improvement projects. If, uh, can I just say this, Courtney, before you go further? I would like to say that we're happy to have the new county appointment um, to our uh, commission, and that is, uh, that is Simpson. Brown, uh, Skip, I guess most of us know by Skip Brown, but uh, he will be joining us. He will be sworn in. He couldn't make it today, but he will be sworn in and hopefully he will be at our next meeting as a part of the commission. So we're certainly glad to have him on board. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, so I've already uh, introduced you to the engineering students. We currently sit in at 72 <coughs> departmental vacancies. I think last month we were at 66, and now we're back up to 70. So mm -hmm. it feels like every time we um, fill a vacancy, we turn around and gain a vacancy. So um, it's just an up and down roller coaster for us right now. Um, location and topics for the upcoming year. Um, I'm looking at topics for the next year, trying to plan that out. If anybody has anything specific that they would like to hear about, please let me know, I'm open to any feedback. Um, and also before the pandemic, we started having um, maybe twice a year, our commission meetings at other locations, like at our water treatment plants, we had one at uh, the landfill where we did a tour of the landfill. So I wanna pick that back up. So probably within the next year, look to have at least two um, offsite, you know, one at one of our facilities having uh, a commission meeting at those, at those um, areas. Just a reminder, portraits, we need your portraits um, to update our website. If you have one, submit it to Gail. If you need to have one taken, she can um, work with you to schedule um, a time to go to marketing to get that picture. And if anybody had any time this after the meeting, you can do it. I know Mr. Jernigan came before, so he had his oh, okay. his yeah. picture taken. So Didn't break the camera. Okay, good. <laughs> That's a bliss. <laughs> so um and then orientation for new members. I know Mr. Curtis mentioned that we do have um, Mr. Brown who's a new going to be joining us. Um, soon, and then we'll have a new city appointee that hasn't been appointed yet, but at some point we'll have a new one. Um, Mr. Usash is new. Uh, Mr. Wilson, you joined us right in the midst of the pandemic and did not get a proper <laughs> orientation. <laughs> so, Second in person. Yeah. Right. So um, I am going to be reaching out to the, you and Mr. U Session and the other two members to schedule a formal orientation for you guys. And, and actually, anybody else that wants to join that is interested in a refresher, of course, you're more than welcome to join us, but that'll be happening soon. And then um, Juneteenth Festival at Bailey Park, we had a booth and there was um, over 6,000 in attendance, about 65. 100 in attendance. Yeah, it was a good turnout. Um, and here's a picture of the uh, the festival. And this is Michael Guerin, who's part of our industrial waste uh, program, industrial waste control program. So him and Gail, he and Gail were at the um, at the festival. Um, okay. I don't know how. Okay, cool. Sorry. <laughs> Um, got a little snafu with the streaming. Yeah, you might have to do it. I don't know how to. You have to uh, you do something on your show. I'm sure you might see that now. Okay, hold on just a second. He is recording it. Uh, he is recording it. Yeah, just, just not able to live stream yeah. it. Okay, we'll just keep going. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so it was a good turnout, and we were there to hand out literature and to educate. Um, anyone that was in attendance that day, so. Good. A lot of people stopped by the booth, actually stopped by. Oh, yeah. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> well, we have this cool prize wheel right here, and I think that <laughs> gets people's <laughs> attention. <laughs> Very engaged. <laughs> okay. Good. Right. And speaking of prizes and goodies, um, everybody has one of these as their seat. This is like a tape measure. Um, never know when you might need a tape measure, so there it is. Um, and you can, you can take that, that home. Um, okay, so with that, I will turn it over to Bill and he can do our treatment plant updates. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we'll start with our normal updates. Hey, Bill, can you, um, I know you can't see yourself, but if you can stand right in there, there you go. Um, w. Kerr Scott, you can see it, it started to drop off through the month of June, and that's due to rainfall. If you'll notice on the graph, we, we only received about an inch of rainfall in the entire month of June. Mm -hmm. Enon um, fell off as well. Now those, those flows and levels have recovered since we've gotten the rains over the weekend and the, of the last week. And I suspect the drought monitor map is gonna change when they update it this Thursday. 
Um, so average production for last year during June was 40.6. For this month, uh, 2022, it was 42.7, which my numbers guy, Ricky here, pointed out that's the highest average production we've had since 2015. Wow. So production was, you know, it was very hot. Uh, no rain, so production was up. That represents a 2.1 million gallon a day increase, of, which is about 5%. And as I noted, uh, the Yakin Basin received only about an inch of rain here in June of 2022. Do you think irrigation was one of the main? Could be, yeah. Yeah, people were watering heavily here in June, for sure. Um, Courtney also asked me to talk about PFAS compounds. Um, as she mentioned, they're, they're also known as forever chemicals. And PFAS are a, a group of substances that are they're per, per polyfluoroalkyl substances. So they're very, they can either be short or very long chain carbon and fluor fluoride compounds. And they, and there's a lot of them. There's about 4,700 of them in the environment. And we're learning about more and more just about every day. They're, they're very widely used. They break down very slowly over time. They're pretty widespread in the environment. They're present in the air, water, food, soil. So they're, they're abundant. Um, they're used in the manufacture of products such as nonstick cooking surfaces, firefighting foams, dental floss, mattresses, anything that has a stain resistant coating like carpeting, furniture, rain gear, that type of thing. So why are we talking about them? Because June 15th, um, the EPA issued final health advisory levels for the Gen X and PFBS, which are two of these PFAS compounds. Now the Gen X chemicals are specific to a process used by Kimors, and a lot of people in Cape Fear River Basin were impacted by the discharge of Kimors into the Cape Fear. Fortunately for us, um, you know, these chemicals do not show up on the yak, and we have not detected them. Um, PFBS are used as repellents and surfactants, stain repellents for things like carpets, furnitures, rain gears, and whatnot. Um, the other thing to note is that health advisory levels are not enforceable standards. So we remain in full compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act primary drinking water standards. Um, and as I mentioned, Gen X and PFBS have not been detected in our source waters. Now, they also issued, issued interim health advisory levels for PFOA and PFOS. Um, the interim health advisory level for PFOA is 0 0.004 parts per trillion, which is an extremely low level. The same can, for PFOS, the interim HAL is 0 0.02. And this is a significant departure from where the health advisory levels were because they, they were a combined concentration of 70 parts per trillion. So they've made a very significant change here. So PFOA and PFOS were used in firefighting foams and food packaging. Um, there again, these, these were showing up in very high levels in the Cape Fear due to the uh, you know, the airport in Greensboro discharging their fire, you know, they, the runoff from, from that airport when they were doing their firefighting exercises um, got into the watershed. And that's why you see those in, in the Cape Fear as well. Bill, so when they measured those in the Cape Fear, what, what, what was the measurement number? Um, was it above 70? Yes, it was very high. So why did they lower it so low? Well, they, Recent studies have indicated that any, any exposure to PFO and PFOS has long-term health impacts. And they, they issue health advisories based on the available science at the time. So as they develop and, and, and studies are refined, they'll use that information. They, they could adjust these further, but I, 
once we get a little bit further into this, they're gonna, they're, I think they're gonna propose legislation um, to re actually regulate these. But what, what they're saying by the issuance of these interim health advisories is at any levels they feel are detrimental over a lifetime of exposure. Did that answer your, your question? Um, so another thing to note are these interim health advisory levels are actually below what current level met methods can detect. Right? So that's actually how low they are. And they're looking at <clears throat> developing methods um, that, can, that can actually detect at these levels. Because it was, Bill, just you weren't really detecting anything under four parts per trillion, wasn't it? All right, four, four parts per trillion is the reporting level. Right. And um, in, in laboratories, you have a reporting level, which is a, it's a confidence level. You can say 90, 95% of the time, we, we can reproduce this number and we're confident that it's accurate and that it's precise. So that we're, we're getting the same number over and over. But once you get below that, your, your accuracy deteriorates very rapidly. What about some of the other bases? I mean, if I go to Raleigh and Cary, are they in the same shape as what I'm hearing coming out of Gilbert County? Or do you know? Yeah, that's the same watershed. Same watershed. Yeah, so everything kind of the west of Kernersville in the hall on the road that drains into the Cape Fear River Basin. So they've all been impacted by um, the, the runoff from the airport in Greensboro and the Timberworks discharges that were put into the, um, into the Cape Fear. So, so, so Raleigh's not a stream of that or anything. They, they're a recipient of that out of Yes, part, yeah. yeah. Are we going to have the only clean water in the state? Well, these, <laughs> these things are showing up, uh, deep boss and deep over showing up across the state in some levels. And I, I have some data to show you on the next slide that hopefully we'll put that into, into perspective. So EPA plans to issue a proposed PFAS National Drinking Water Standard this, this fall. Um, there'll be a comment period, and then they'll, um, based on that comment period, um, they plan to issue final standards in 2023, or in the fall of 2023. As they develop the proposed rule, um, they're evaluating regulating additional PFAS beyond PFO and, and PFAS, and they're considering actions to address groups of PFAS. So what that means is, um, in the Kimor's case, there's signature compounds associated with Kimor's. There's like five of them. So they could they could choose to regulate that group of five that are associated with that discharge, or they can take other similar compounds and treat them as a group. So we really don't know exactly how this is going to turn out, but we do know that beyond PFO and PFOS, they are considering regulating other groups of these compounds. And, and I guess that's based on what they found to be detrimental to health over some sort of testing period? That's correct. Can you clean this out of the water once it's in it? There, there are technologies that can be used to remove them. Um, I did want to point out one other thing. This this should be um, June fifteenth, twenty twenty two. Yes. Instead of twenty twenty, just so you know, that's that's a typo there. Yeah. Just recent. Yeah. We just recently. It was just last month. Yeah. That's why you hear about it. That's why you're here about it in the news a lot. Yeah. That's good. Um, you can go to the next slide. So th this is the data that I was talking about. If you look at We'll talk about just PFOA first. If you look across the top, you'll see the min average and max for our facilities for Thomas, Nielsen, and Swan. This, this, this represents 
the data taken from March 18th to present. We've been monitoring our raw water for these chemicals since 2018. In 2018, the North Carolina collaboratory, PFAS collaboratory sampled all the watersheds in North Carolina. And the min average and max detections from that sampling event are in that NC collab peers column. So comparatively speaking, our numbers are extremely low compared to some of the detections across the state. However, they are above the interim HAL 0 0.004. And the same is true for PFOS. Um, you know, the highest level that we've detected is 4.12 parts per trillion. Um, the highest amongst our peers was 98, and the lowest was four. So we're in the, in the very bottom um, of range that was detected in North Carolina, but we're still above that 0 0.02. So these interim, but most utilities across the country are going to find themselves in excess of these interim HAL. Um, and just for reference, one part per trillion is like one drop in an Olympic sized swimming pool. So if you divide that one drop into 1,000 parts, you take four of those, you get the 0 0.004. So it's extremely, extremely small numbers that we're talking about. So the EPA recognizes that PFAS compounds are widespread and they developed uh, what they call a PFAS strategic roadmap. And it focuses on three areas, um, research, and that's to increase the understanding of, of PFAS exposure, its toxicities, and incorporate the best available science in determining those toxicities. Um, restrict, which is a comprehensive approach to prevent them from entering in the environment. And they are looking to regulate these directly at the source. Um, and then remediate, and, which is to broaden and accelerate the cl cleanup. And this is uh, through mechanisms like the Superfund cleanup uh, program and, and things of that nature. They have made some funding available. Um, there is one billion in grant funding available through the bipartisan infrastructure law to help communities most in, impacted by PFAS, and then also the five billion um, that they've allocated for low interest loans can also be used to reduce PFAS in communities facing disproportionate impacts. So there is potentially funding available to help communities deal deal with what they're seeing in their water sources. Because we're on the lower side of that, does that mean we have less of a chance of getting some of those funds? I, I don't believe so. If we'll have to wait and see what the regulatory levels actually are and if, if they impact us. Okay. But I think if, if they do impact us, then I think it would it would open up funding for us. And when is that expected? I mean, is it I know we're interim now, but is there any idea when? Would be yeah when when the EPA announces the regulatory levels this fall oh, okay. yeah I think communities will start moving towards that as the regulatory level okay. and there there are some states um, there there's a lot of states that have actually already started regulating these things and the, and the levels are just all over the map the the lowest one is California which California is usually always on the leading edge of developing regulations and they've regulated, P, I believe it's PFOA at five parts per trillion. Mm -hmm. So I think the EPA recognizes that a lot of states are taking action. So they're moving forward fast to try to uh, gain a consistent regulatory environment across the board. Now are these, PFAS chemicals, are they only produced or do any exist naturally? Yeah, they're all man-made. They're all man-made, yeah. They're all, 
from some sort of manufacturing process. Do we have any, any more questions? So, so we have a, at least you have some sort of idea of how we might start approaching remediating those levels when it comes down to it. Yes, we, we've got some tools at our disposal right now. We, we feed powder activated carbon at Nielsen and, and Swan. We're going to start looking into uh, seeing how much of a reduction using powder activated carbon we can get from the raw, you know, through to our, our treated source. Does it, does this also mean we need to get new detection devices, I guess, to be able to detect lower levels? Yeah, I think EPA, the next step is that EPA and researchers need to develop methods okay. that can actually get, you know, get that low. Okay. Um, and reproducible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. Exactly right. And, and just because they set these interim health advisory levels, it doesn't mean that um, that's what the regulatory level is doing. Um, you know, they could come back and, and set a level higher. It's just based on what information they have today, they feel like that's appropriate. Yeah. It was alarming. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, it's good to know that we are on the, the lower side of that just mm -hmm. traditionally. So, yeah. um, because of our environment. So, that's great to hear. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Are there any other questions for him? Yeah, these these are pretty pervasive too. I mean, they're they're having a hard time finding anywhere that you don't find these for some reason. Yeah, they're they're very widespread. Is the EPA seem like they're going to be more concerned about this than they are the phosphorus and nitrogen on the wastewater side? You're yeah. Saying? yeah. Um. I mean, just from an expense standpoint. I think this is. I think. And my personal opinion, I think it has, it's risen to um, where it's been talked about like that more. So, I mean, obviously on the, on the uh, wastewater side, nitrogen phosphorus that are also being, being reviewed, but it does seem like this is kind of rising to the top. Rising to the top. <clears throat> well, right. well done, Bill. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to point out this picture. It's oh. Sorry. Slow down, slow down. <laughs> this is our fearless leader, Courtney Driver, of oh, Water Main Break. Oh, I, I did a lot of work out there, right? She does. This is, uh, Get her hands on her head. Yeah. I'm just going to comment that safety vest is very, very clean. <laughs> All right, moving on. We, we closed out fiscal year 22 with 58 water and sewer conveyance agreements, totaling $13.24 million. This next graph, you'll see the breakdown between water and sewer mileage with 13.9 miles of water mains and 10.6 miles of sewer mains, which is pretty significant uh, compared to previous years. Collection system update. This hasn't changed since we presented it last month. Uh, we haven't received a report from May or June and obviously not July uh, quite yet. This is where the great news starts. So FY 2020 and 2021, we finished at 74 SSOs for sanitary sewer overflows for the for the entire year. Yeah. Both years were, were, were record lows for, for us. Yeah. This year we finished at 55. Wow. Our goal was 68. Yeah. So I, I want to point that out. Not only is that just absolutely critical to me, but that's in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, record staff, you know, vacancies, uh, challenges everywhere you look. So uh, we had a really, really good year. Great. Great, great. And even better is we didn't have any SSOs in June. So I believe that's the first time in six years of this program where we've not had a single SSO in a calendar month. Wow. And you can see the red trend line for five years where you normally have around six uh, in June. It probably helped not having any rain. Yeah. <laughs> that did help. <laughs> uh, more good news, cleaning productivity. That for the first you know 10 or 11 months, we were slightly behind our cleaning productivity goal of uh, 18%. We kind of picked up production in, in June and finished, I think it was 323 miles of pipe clean this fiscal year. Great. 
What facilitated the pickup? Contract control crews, to be honest. We, you know, we at the beginning of the year when we issue a new PO, you kind of start slow and then, you know, you get fall and winter weather and, you know, it gets cold and wet and, you know, got dry. So luckily we just picked up production. What's our cycle time on it? Like in five years, we will we have cleaned everything at least once? I, give me a couple slides and I'll tell you. <laughs> you're, you're beating me to it, Mr. Long. So uh, item three on your agenda is the collection system improvement uh, year seven award. We've been through six years of this so far. You can also see the, the progress we've made. Th this is a graph of the performance. Since 2015 pre-program, we had 124 <coughs> SSOs. Mm -hmm. In six years, we're down to 55, mm -hmm. an increase or decrease of over 55%. Mm -hmm. That red line is just O&M related SSOs, so fats, oils, uh, grease, Debris, those are kind of related strictly to cleaning. So you can see a nice downward trend across mm -hmm. all of them. Mm -hmm. This is the breakdown of fiscal year 22 by cause. You know, the large majority is OM related. So we got to keep cleaning and cleaning, you know, a lot. Um, the second biggest contributor is pipe failure. So the CSIP also has a significant impact on the condition assessment of these pipes and rehab. And then the other, those are ones that don't fit into really any good category. They would be, you know, one-offs, maybe like a bypass pump failure on a project or something like that. Mm -hmm. This is gonna answer your question, Mr. Long. Our initial uh, goal of the program was to clean the entire system in 10 years. So we're six years into this thing. We're still tracking very well. We've cleaned 58%, we have 42% left. So we've cleaned over 1,020 miles of pipe, unique pipe. Um, out of the system. So we're still on track and, you know, in 10 years when the program's done, every pipe in the system be clean, unexpected. And then this is the last um, PowerPoint slide for CSIP. This is just a representation of the rehab work we've done throughout the county. So the, the pink salmon color, that is repair uh, projects that we've not started yet, but we have identified Purple is what's in progress and, and white blue is what's been completed. And you can kind of see that, you know, we don't target a, a specific area. It, we target the, the worst of the worst. That might be in Kernersville or Clemens or Rural Hall, might be in downtown Winston-Salem. So um, we don't care where it is. We care, you know, how bad the pipe is and focus our attention there. I believe that's the last one. It is great to see the investment payout. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it, it has been a big investment, yeah. but it has yeah. definitely paid off. Mm -hmm. For sure. Any other questions? So when you, I've got a question. So when you say paid off, what what is the cost benefit analysis on that? The amount of money we spent versus the potential amount of money that we have saved due to that. I, I don't have an answer for you, but I know that the initial uh, intent of the program was to avoid a 308 letter, which means that, uh, or consent decree, right. where the, the state can say, you've had, you know, an enormous amount of SSOs, we're going to mandate that you come in and spend several hundred million dollars to rehab your system. Yeah. So I don't know exactly what that number may have been. It could be a lot. It That's could right. be several hundred million dollars. At their pace. I mean, they could say, you know, we've kind of taken over 10 years. They could say, well, you have to do it within two years. Or they could shut you down, like give you more, put you on a moratorium where you can't issue any more permits. So you stop pretty much halt development. So it's hard to really well quantify that. But I guess for me, you know, I remember in these meetings we'd all be talking all talk about SSOs. How much is it? Well, it's going, you know, it's, well, how can we stop this? You know, how can we get ahead of this? And it was just good to see a program. That we implemented to kind of get us ahead of the curve. Because my biggest concern was, well, if you do have an SS, you've got you got something you can show how you've been trying to manage it, so that you know they won't lay the hammer down on you so hard. You know, if you do have a situation like that, so trying to stay proactive and ahead of that program instead of somebody telling you this is what you got to do. Right. I think it's great. Are we among the first of our peer cities and systems to do this kind of program? I mean. I've based based on the success of it, I would so, imagine if a pure city looks at I know they that some uh, issues what we had uh, yeah. eight years ago. I would say um, that 
other our other some of our other peer utilities so some of the other larger utilities had had they had rehab programs and they were probably rehabbing more than than we were to begin with however this holistic approach where we're rehabbing and we're cleaning i think we are probably one of the first and and really we have been a success story that's been told at conferences so statewide conferences um and other utilities are getting on board and want to do the same program so yeah we have been leading um by example, um, which, I'm, which I think is really good um, for the program. It would be good if you, if you had, I don't know how you quantify, I think Mr. Park, Commissioner Parker had a good point, some way to get some hand, num, handle around the, the numbers of the dollars would be great to, to do. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm just mm -hmm. thinking, because, you know, we're responding to whatever the dean or EPA or whatever governing organization says we need to do, but I would imagine there is some type of cost benefits analysis because we're able to target our improvements mm -hmm. where before mm -hmm. we might have only been able to do it based upon, I don't know, age or mm -hmm. after the fact, after the fact is always a bigger problem, mm -hmm. right? Because we don't like having her out there in the yellow jacket. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, as we've made, because you said we've targeted more than $24 million in investments. Would we have done those projects if we didn't have this data, or would we have been spending that money somewhere else and maybe not as efficiently? We'd still be spending it, but you'd probably be spending more and, and less efficiently. But I do think we can mm -hmm. maybe look at um, some other utilities that did have dis uh, descent decrees or moratoriums and see what. Uh, what they had to spend and maybe see what information's out there for some similar size utilities. Because right. um, I mean, you could just look at it based on total amount we spent and how we decrease the number of SSOs. And we could say that it's costing us, I don't know, $300,000 per decreased SSO. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then you say, okay, that's what the, you know, maybe that's where the money, but then there's the cost savings because we're able to target um, how we're spending our right. investments. Right. So it's, I, I just think that beyond just saying, oh, well, we're not having a consent decree, therefore we're saving $300 million. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. But to say this is actually improving our mm -hmm. system. Well, and, and that's a great point because something like this, in my opinion, you can't, you can't just solely uh, compare with cost. So we have to, we, we, we should be doing this anyway, right? Mm -hmm. We, you know, we don't want to spill any wastewater on the ground at all. Mm -hmm. um, so not only we limit the number of vessels, we're also limiting the volume, which is also a really big thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, another part of this program that I've, I've mentioned a couple of years back is the field verification. So basically that we take a project from the master plan, they're capacity driven projects, and we have went back and field verified. So you know, the master plan, they looked at it from a very high level and, and said that this pipe needs to be upside. We have dived down a little bit, added more flow meters, and, and, and actually said this product can be deferred two years or three years or five years. So that's where your cost savings are coming in at. Thank you. Yeah, good Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. So we've completed our fiscal year and the income from waste stream at Hayes Mill Red Landfill ended up at 297,426 tons. So it was about 16,000 tons higher than last year, um, ahead of the budget, obviously. And actually a record, I think that's the highest tonnage since the year 2000 that we've had. And you'll remember in the next slide, you see the monthly tonnage and you'll remember that the OS, Old Salisbury Road Landfill, the construction and demolition landfill, was closed during the winter months, so that added into that total that we just looked at. We're pretty much back to an average year, 25,000 tons, 225 in, 225 tons in the month of June. So as we mentioned, Old Salisbury Road was closed during the winter months, but we're back to um, pretty much a typical number here, 3,400 tons in the month of June for a total of 27,000, just over 27,000. Any questions about tonnage? We wanted to remind you that there is an up on the informational meeting coming up. Um, we have this ongoing MSE burn project in Hainesville Road landfill. 
and we've invited the neighbors to come around and get more information about it, send out the notice that I think we shared with everybody. Did you need any of the commissioners yeah. to be at that meeting? I think Mr. Jernigan mentioned that he might attend. Um, you're certainly welcome, absolutely welcome. Anyone's welcome to come if you're so inclined. No questions about that? Okay. Okay, um, next on our agenda is um, the actual items. And so um, the first item is the approval of the meeting minutes. Uh, uh, so I guess, again, what we'd like to do is uh, as, we, as we get to the end of this, let's just vote on this through, cons through our consent. If there are any items at the very end we feel like we need to pull, then we'll pull that and, and do the consent. Okay. Where's the picture? What, this picture? The one back yeah, there? Yeah, the one, the, yeah. your picture just before that. This thing is not. What was your question? What was the picture? Well, where, where? I, I don't know where it was at, but it was the reduced pressure uh, yeah. backflow assembly. It's like it was just installed. Okay. I cannot get, hold on. Maybe. Okay. No, 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 don't want to do that. I just, you're a little ahead. You're like it was you. Probably was. I don't know. You probably found it in the photo bank. It's, it was put in tomorrow. <laughs> it's in the PowerPoint to talk feature. about the, the cross-section control. Too many curious period people. <laughs> <laughs> Too many curious people. No, not at all. I don't know the reason, the source of it. Okay. Somebody else did. Everybody ready? Yeah. Perfect. Item two was consideration of a resolution authorizing execution of various agreements regarding proposed water and sanitary sewer improvements to be installed within various developments. There's four developments. Uh, total estimate cost for water improvements is $675,650. Total estimate cost for sewer improvements, $1,655,510. Any uh, questions on item two? Okay. Item three uh, was the talked about just a minute ago is um, award of CSIP year seven. Um, the uh, scope and fee for year seven was negotiated at five million six hundred seventy two thousand nine hundred sixty dollars and it's consistent with pricing for these services of this nature in previous years. We've already kind of peaked as far as uh, fee goes and we're on the downhill trend. So the next couple of years we'll, we'll work towards transitioning activities from our consultant back to our in-house staff. Uh, there will still be needs for contracting certain services out, um, but that fee you should expect to keep going down. It, it, even the fact that, we, I mean, staff is limited, I mean, is that still an issue? Still? Well, uh, I would say we hope to, but obviously if if we still have staffing challenges in, yeah. in year 10 like we do now. Gotcha. But, well, I, I do want to point out that it, we're doing more through this program even before, um, you know, we get started. So, there are things that we're doing through HDR that we don't, even if we were fully staffed, we wouldn't have capacity to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we went through every single activity they're doing for us and kind of looked at, okay, th this is one we're going to bring back in the house. This is one that we're maybe not even going to do at all. This is one that we're going to continue to contract out. So we're working through those conversations yeah. now. So included in the scope is staff augmentation support? Correct. What? What specifically does that entail? So uh, we have, um, I don't know exactly how many, but there's there's uh, full-time staff at HDR, one of which is a planner scheduler. So they schedule and plan our cleaning uh, services, sewer cleaning, um, as well as easement clearing, that type of thing. They actually prepare those KPIs that we present every month. Okay. And there's some other uh, services they provide as well. Any other questions on item three? Okay, item four. I believe there's a, a slide for this one. Um, th this is the Highway 65 water line extension. Th this is between Rural Hall and Germanton. Uh, the red line is the proposed water main. It starts roughly around Rural Hall Elementary School and ends at Abshire Road. Eight inch duck garden main. Uh, there's no water there currently. I believe some of the residents in the past have had concerns with private wells. Um, some of you are familiar with uh, Mr. Stewart when he was on the commission, his concerns. Here's a slide kind of showing the history. Um, a couple years back, 
Forsyth County applied for a CDBG grant uh, to extend water along Highway 65. Utilities agreed to administer the project with the understanding that the water line would be uh, conveyed to uh, the city of Winston for ownership maintenance. In lieu of the CDBG uh, application, the city actually, the city was not the county, actually received $3.1 million in, in ARPA funds. Uh, we got that two Mondays ago. Uh, we went through an RFQ process. There was four different proposals. Hazen and Sawyer was selected for design bidding and construction administration services at $460,000. And that is item four. And then there will be another item in the future. I don't know if it'll be next month or a couple months down the road with an interlocal agreement between utilities and Forsyth County for an additional $500,000 in funds if needed. So, Mike, I'm confused. I'm reading in here, it says, let's say Forsyth County Utilities plans to partner with Forsyth County. But then in here, you're saying the ARPA money was through the city of Winston. Yeah. Right, so yeah. the, the $3.1 million of funds, that, that is in the city of Winston-Salem's name. So, in theory, if the if the design, the construction, the easements, if all the, the expenses come in below 3.1, we really don't need anything from the county. Forsyth County is identifying an additional $500,000 of funds to be used if the project exceeds $3.1 million. And I'll, let me add to that. So it started, the, the Forsyth County started this project with the application for the CDBG um, funding. <laughs> With the state, and at some point, the state had decided, and we don't know really what all the conversations or discussions were had, but at some point, the state decided we're not going to use uh, CDBG funds, we're just going to use the state's allocated ARPA funds. So, they, knowing that the, the ownership of the waterline would ultimately be with the city of Winston Salem. They went ahead and allocated the funds to the city of Winston Salem instead of to Forsyth County, and then of course Forsyth County would just have to transfer them to us um, to do the project. So that's how it ended up. So already, even, in, though, even though that's not in city limits. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, but it's for it's to be used on that project, which is up in the county. So. Can you go back to the map once once yeah. that? Uh, I can get there. Just uh -oh. give me a second. <laughs> right, here's my question without the map. <laughs> there we go. With, this looks like I see Broad Street over here on the left in blue. Yep. Which is downtown Rural Hall, if you want to call it downtown. Correct. And so this is running east and north. Is everything to the left back toward 52 now covered with soot with water? Yes. Okay. So so it's contiguous through there. Correct. Right, thank you. Mr. President, that answer your question as far as the funding. To clarify your question. Yeah. I, it sounds like we we've even got a backup. So as far as from our budget, there shouldn't be an impact. Right. And and we'll so we'll have that interlocal agreement with the county. Um, they're going to use some of their ARPA funds as well to cover any if there's any overages. But that's what basically what that interlocal agreement will be when we bring it back to you is. If it does exceed the estimate of 3.1 million, what happens? And so um, that's what the agreement will be for. And this item four that we're voting on would be with Hazen. That's part of that 3.1 million. Right. It's just, right. right. We felt comfortable bringing you the item for 460,000 because we have 3.1. Um, we will not bring a construction contract award before we have an interlocal agreement in place between the county and the utility commission. Can I ask a question about this election process? Yeah. Are you about to get to that? Well, since I was looking at the rankings between the three different firms, two of the line items kind of jumped out to me was understanding the project and past performance. Um, and I know, I, I believe we've had a, a relationship with Highfield for a while. I'm not sure about this, this RK and K. I know they're, they're not in our area. Um, but I, I see that past performance was one of the things that Highfield scored low on versus Hazen and Sawyer. Do you have any 
in that process, how did we, I mean, how do you, how do you do past performance? Is it past performance based on their work with us? Or is it past performance based on their work on these type of projects, which I would think would be understanding a project? It, it, it could be both. I'm, I'm going to let Shane answer that. She was part of the panel. I was not, but usually past performance is measured by either the project management team, in this case, Shane and her group, or um, if we, let's say, for example, you know, RK and K, if we didn't have any experience with them, we would check the references and use the references experience. Yes, so Mr. Parker, I guess um, during this project, um, we've had some, uh, not issues, uh, just some concerns about high fill. And also, I think a big part of it is um, maybe because um, Hazen and Sawyer actually did the, the um, preliminary cost estimate, the 3.1 million that was submitted to the county. And so, uh, I know that doesn't- Well, that would be well, understanding a project, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, and I would probably add that, you know, we've used high fuel significantly on mainly wastewater projects. I don't know if this went into your decision, Shane, oh. but Hazen, we have a ton of experience. They used to uh, run our distribution system model the master plan. So I don't know if that had a factor or not, but Hazen is much more experienced on the water side than uh, high fill. Okay. Well, I'm just looking at that line item. That looks yeah. like that's the difference in the yeah. score. Yeah. I mean, I guess to, you know, to Mr. Parker's point, I guess it wasn't enough to say we need to, there was something that you weren't happy with, but it wasn't to the point to where we don't want to go on the project again. Yeah. Do you have a, a second question on that? Uh, I, it, I can get with y'all later on just that past performance chart. Okay. Uh, any other questions before we move to item five? Okay, item five is a consideration of resolution awarding a contract for cross national control program management services. Uh, we figured that not everybody in the room might have an understanding of what a cross connection is. We wanted to, to share a definition and share some uh, history with this. So a cross connection is an actual or potential connection between any part of the potable water system and an environment that will allow substances to enter the potable water system. Back in 2019, uh, North Carolina Administrative Code Section 18C.0406B took effect and it included uh, different criteria, mainly uh, additional record keeping requirements. So that, that took effect July 1st, 2019. In November of that year, uh, plan, the commission adopted revision to the water system policy resolution to align with those new requirements. Um, since then, in March, 2021, we engaged with BSI online to streamline the backflow test report submittal process. That was kind of the history, very high level history. <clears throat> Moving forward uh, with this with this item, back in March, we issued an RFP for program management services. We received one proposal, Raptel, some of you guys and gals may uh, recognize the name. <clears throat> they helped us with our cost of service study and rate uh, modeling. <clears throat> the program is intended to evaluate existing business processes and conduct a gap assessment from where we are as a program now and, and where we need to be to be in compliance with the regulatory requirements. <clears throat> the program will provide business process and or technology driven recommendations to ensure compliance prior to crossing this control inventory work. So part of that uh, record keeping requirement <clears throat> requires us to have an inventory of all uh, devices that pose a high health hazard if they fail. We have to have location, type, size, um, the category of, of hazard. So we haven't done that yet. And the reason we haven't, this group is fairly new. Uh, we put it together back in 2019. You probably recognize some of the new positions in the budget over the last couple of years. We've been getting our feet underneath us. And before we get to spend several million dollars on the inventory, we want to make sure that we can manage that data 
and that our systems are in, in place and we're taking full advantage of that. What does a valve cost? What does a what cost? A back, back row valve cost. It, it depends on the size that it can be. One inch. A couple thousand dollars, maybe. Okay, go back to slide. Okay. Babe, hold on. <laughs> Um, okay, so I just wanted to make sure on this North Carolina Administrative Code. So I get this um, letter from Wood South or Slade County Utilities about cross connection control. Now, honestly, I think I've been doing this in my business for well over 10 years, but it seemed like we talked a year or two ago about how now there's finally going to be some type of, I don't know, follow up to make sure that we're actually handling it. Um, this is just fresh in my mind because I just did this this past month and you probably have some you've done too. So I, what I'm trying to figure out is the system that we have right now that's recording this, making sure that the, the property owners are doing, because we also had to do this for the irrigation system for a neighborhood. How is that different than what we're talking about here? Do right, we not have a right inventory of what's out there? Are there some people slipping through the cracks? Yeah, that, that, that is a fantastic question. So the, the way I was explaining this to Courtney last week, the cross test control program, that, that, that's your pie. The, the BSI online work is a slice of the pie. So that that work they're doing is, is literally just taking the, the annual backflow test report and uploading it to their system so we can visualize that, we can document it, run, run different uh, graphs and such. As far as this program, we're looking at this from an end-to-end -end solution. So trying to capture any new devices, you know, for new construction, or maybe somebody puts in an irrigation meter. How does that permit process look? How does that get uploaded in all our, our systems? How does it get communicated back to the customer to get billed, or not billed, but get their, their letter to, to do their annual testing once a year? And how does all that communicate back and forth? Are we feeling like what we're doing now apparently is not adequate? Or do we just not know? I think we, we only have the data. We have certain data. And we give that to BSI and they just send the letters out to us and help us track it. This is, it's, it's more deeper. It's deeper than that because it's how do we manage all these new ones that come in, making sure they're, they've got the proper back play devices in place. Anytime there's a change in ownership, we have to have a mechanism to, to, to track that. So they're going to help us develop a standard operating procedure, a business process of what that needs, what do we need to do to make sure we're staying on top of everything. Um, and BSI is not giving us that, but it's just really just a... Uh, it's a online Reporting. software, Reporting. Reporting software. Yeah. So Keep in mind, our program is really still in its infancy, right? So we've had the, the policy for several years. We haven't had the staff to implement the policy. So um, compared to other utilities, where are we? We're not leading the pack. I would say we're maybe slightly behind. Um, Durham has a very robust cross mission control program. So does Charlotte. I know Charlotte's had some, some um, contamination issues in the past. But luckily, we haven't uh, to date. But now that the, the regulation is out there and we know about it, you know, we're, we're working to, to be a top performer, but we're not quite there yet. From that. So, is the regulatory code, is that what defines that this needs to be done annually? Or is that a decision that we made? No. As far as the testing goes? Yeah. That's in the code. It's an uh, annual inspection. Yeah, I believe it's a, not only annual, but it's a, a local policy too. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that what we're doing right now is not adequate to meet the administrative code. So we need this extra money to do a better job of. And there was only one vendor that we got a bid from. Correct. And we check references and check their proposal and feel confident that they can perform very well. Has Raptalis done this for other utilities within the state? I think they have. Um, they also have a, uh, they purchased Western Technologies 
who, who does a lot of this work as well. So they have a pretty robust team and set of references that we check. Is, is this going to be an ongoing thing or is this a one time thing? No, this is a one time thing. Thank you. Okay. Item six is consideration resolution requesting MWB goals to be set below the 10% minimum goal for the water service line renewal project. The city's internal MWB committee met to identify some contracting opportunities for the water service line renewal project. After reviewing the scope of work and project specifications, it was determined that the subcontracting opportunities are nominal. I want to remind everybody that Shakira and her group that they meet with the MWB committee, they have to set verifiable goals. They, they can't set goals higher than what the contracting community can actually do. <clears throat> the committee met, and it is the recommenda recommendation of the city's internal MWB committee that the MWB participation goals <clears throat> be set at 4% MB and 2% WB. Any questions on this one? Okay. Uh, item seven through 10 have the same backstory as last month um, due to current volatility in the chemical markets, price escalation of raw materials, and increasing transportation costs. We've decided to remit chemicals on six months' terms. So, item seven is a consideration of a resolution awarding a term contract to Unibar Solutions USA Inc. for sodium hypochlorite at the water and wastewater treatment plants. Um, staff recommends awarding a purchase order to Univar for an estimated 415,000 gallons of sodium hypochlorite and the estimated total amount of $683.120. If the contract is extended, the total estimated expenditure over two and a half years would be approximately $3,419,600. No, I've, I've got a just a clarification question. Um, as I look through these next four, just for instance, item seven and item um, 10, Brentag Mid South was on the list, but then both times it said no bid. So if they didn't do a bid, why were they on the list? Yeah. They were sent a notice. Yeah. Okay. So, but it says summary response of bids received. I asked there in Redfield that question. And um, well, so a lot of times, well, this are you getting that, Courtney? A lot of times, what will happen is you know, you're expecting people to show up for the bid, so you've got a certain number of people that have shown interest and in they say, Yes, I want to bid the project, so you've got them on the bid list, they're on the list. So, on that day of receiving bids, you've got a you've already typed out the people that have you know they've said they're interested, and, and a lot of times, what we'll do is if the people that have uh, that have shown interest in wanting to bid, we make sure they're there. And if there are no show, we, we just note that they just didn't show up for the bid. So it's not like we there was nobody that was just one person interested or you know there was not a whole group of other people that were interested, they were identified. And for whatever reason, they didn't show up. It's just, I mean, I think for me, as, as we go through, it's just a documentation to say, yes, they were interested, yes, they were prepared to bid, but at the last minute, they didn't submit it. Yeah, so I do. We do like to try to show for outreach. We don't. If you prefer us not to show them, though, when they don't submit a bid, we can do that. But we do like to try to show, hey, we did reach out to these companies so that you don't think that it's, you know, we're just doing, you know, two companies every time that okay. we're trying to reach out to as many as possible. Okay, I and guess it was just I mean, yeah, thinking, yeah, what is the definition yeah. of responsive? Because right. if we didn't put a bid for it, that doesn't seem responsive. We actually talked yeah. about this. We, we asked the same question. And and and, and Darren Rento works for um, Chantel and Purchase and does a lot of these chemical contracts for us. And I asked him that question. And, and his response was, if a chemical company submitted a physical no bid, mm -hmm. um, I felt that should be recorded as at least they are interested versus a no response. Mm -hmm. So I guess they... Responded they to responded, it and said but no bid, good. but you know. Okay, and so following along with understanding these charts, if I look at item A, there's a percentage change, and we always have like the top one has a percentage change, but even when we get other bids, we don't put that percentage change 
is that telling me that, for instance, on this first one, Unimar got a percentage change. Were they the previous provider? Are they the current provider? Or in the next one, was PBS the current provider? I mean, why did we? I don't think it necessarily means that they're the current provider, just the percent change of what we did, you know, cost that we had the yeah. last time. Yeah, it's, it's an increase above what we're currently paying under our current contract. And for this particular one, you know, our solutions is the provider, is our current provider. Because we From that. So because we are going to select, um, like looking at the next one where we have PBS and Kamara who both put in bids, we only put the percentage change on the bid that we're going to accept. Exactly. Okay. These prices are so wild. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, they are. They are crazy. And, and we we've, we've got like a six month window to deal with this. Yeah. And six months from now, they may be even more wild. That's true. Uh, they could go go up more. Do we have capacity to store this stuff on site where we could double an order or such like that, or is it even available? We, we do have storage capacity, and at the end of this fiscal year, what we did is, is we maximized our orders to get as much chemical on site as, as we possibly could. Yeah. Um, typically, we, um, I forget what the design criteria are, but it, and it varies by chemical because some, some of these chemicals we use a lot more than others, uh, but it's typically a, a minimum of 30 days storage on site for the the ones that we use the most. Where are we getting them from? Are they coming from offshore? No, mo most of them are domestically produced. As a matter of fact, I, I believe all of them are. Caustic used to be uh, one that came from offshore, but we uh, we stipulated that it had to be produced in, in the United States. So we're just having, I mean, is it a greater than average demand? Is it transportation cost? It's transportation cost is one factor, but the raw materials are escalating significantly. It's the, the sulfuric acids that are used to make, like alum, for instance. It's the phosphate component of the zinc orthophosphate. It's the, it's the chloride component. It, those are all materials that are having to either be mined or produced in some way. Those costs are just, just going to is there a way to order more so that we don't stand the percent increase as bad the next time? In other words, we're probably blowing the budget out to do that. Think way I have to schedule. Yeah, no, our, our, we're limited by our storage ability. Okay, that, that's what that. And we don't know what's down the road. I mean, we could have we're a recession. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Yeah, these prices could recede. And, and that occurred for zinc orthophosphate back in 08. I mean, it, it jumped over. 14, I mean, it was $1,400 per dry ton, and then it dropped back to less than $800 a dry ton. So, I, you know, it, but it could go either way. You don't have a crystal ball on that. <laughs> <laughs> if I do, I'll share it with you. <laughs> Very good. Next, next item. Um, item number A is consideration of a resolution awarding a term contract to PBS Technologies Inc. for ferric fluoride at the wastewater treatment plants. That recommends awarding a purchase order to PBS Technologies Inc. for an estimated 100 dry tons of ferric chloride in the estimated amount of $96,500. If the contract is extended, the total estimated expenditure of two years would be approximately $386,000. Any questions for item A? Item nine is consideration of a resolution during a term contract for PINCO for chlor silicic acid at the water treatment plants. Staff recommends it awarding a purchase order to PINCO Inc. in the estimated amount of 140 tons of chlor silicic acid. That's a tongue twister, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And the estimated total amount of $60,200. If extended, the expenditure over two and a half years will be approximately $301,000. Questions about item nine. Item 10 is a consideration of a resolution awarding term contract to SNF Polydyne Inc. for anti skeleton at the wastewater treatment plants. Staff recommends award a purchase order to SNF Polydyne in the estimated amount of 40,000 pounds. Um, 
estimated total amount is $17,800 if the contract is extended over two years would be approximately $71,200. Right. Item number 11 is a resolution awarding a purchase order to Carolina Tractor to rebuild one two large compactors at Hayes Hill Road Landfill. This is a picture of the actual machine when it was rebuilt in 2016, so it doesn't look quite like that right now. <laughs> we got a quote of $656,852 um, to rebuild this machine. We evaluated other options, uh, buying used or buying a new machine. Used ones are basically not available. A new machine would cost about $1.4 million, and the delivery time would be 12 to 18 months on a new machine. So we recommend giving a purchase order to Carolina Tractor for $689,695, which is the quoted price plus 5% contingency. Take the encounter something unexpected when they tear it down. And it continued at current usages. What, what is the anticipated extended life of this rebuild with it? We usually put about a seven year replacement schedule on the on a rebuild like this. So give or take a year or two. So Jan, when um Charles and the others go for their orientation session. Are they going to get to drive this thing? Well, you can get in it with, with the drive. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It's a ride. Right. Yeah. 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 information um, only, nothing you have to approve, but each year we bring uh, staff evaluates the financing interest rates for any water or sewer special assessments. So as of uh, July 1st, 2022, the federal prime rate was 4.75. So we list the financing rate uh, for certain financing periods in the memo, just as an FYI, if we have a water sewer assessment project, just for information. All right. Is that it? Um, the next is just an update on our uh, CIP. Uh, vote. Vote. Okay. Oh, you got to vote first. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. So, what I'd like to do is, uh, as I said earlier, do this by consent. Are there any any other questions about any of the items first? With that being said, or is there a request from any of the commission uh, uh, commission members to remove an item from the consent agenda? Okay. I'll move approval for items one through 11. Uh, approved by Commissioner Parker. Second. Second by Commissioner Long. Um, Commissioner Yvonne Hines. Yes. Commissioner Hugh Jernigan. Yes. Commissioner Wayne Long. Yes. Commissioner Chris Parker. Yes. Commissioner Charles Wilson. Yes. Commissioner Alan Younger. Yes. Very good. That's uh, approval, announced approval. So that will. Uh, the next item you said was uh, the uh, capital projects. Oh, yeah, capital projects. Yeah. <laughs> so, Shane, Shane yeah. should we get to her today? That's the fun part. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Pull the screen back up for you, Shane. Screen, hopefully. Okay. Yeah, it started where I left off. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is actually my first time presenting in person, so <laughs> yeah. good to see your faces. Good to see you. Yeah, right. um, so first up is our Nielsen Water Treatment Plant Emergency Modernization Project. Um, amount spent to date is about seven point eight percent. This project should be done around May 9th of twenty twenty five. So the EQ Basin slab has been poured, and they're working on forming the walls. The chemical building demolition is still underway. Um, the switchgear building base slab has also been poured and they're working on the walls as well. And Nielsen three and four have been shut down and demo is underway. So if we were to schedule one of our future meetings this year yeah. uh, to see progress, 
would we need to do that toward the end of the year? The yeah, of we actually thought about um, having one there. I know we had one there prior to construction, so you could see what you were going to approve in the construction contract. But I do think that, that it would be good to have one there. I'll, I'll have to talk to Bill and make sure we have the space still. I don't know where the contractor is in the building. And um, obviously we'd have to make sure that we meet all the safety requirements and everything for the contractor. But if that's of interest, we definitely can try to make that work. So we, we could make it happen if it's the worst part. Good. Yeah, with all the money we're spending, I'd love to see progress. Oh, yeah. Of course, I'm only saying you said 8%. So that maybe we want to push that for a later month. There's, there's still a lot of work happening. Mm -hmm. There is, yeah. yeah. So, you just need your steel toe boots, safety hat, goggles. Uh, yeah, I get her safety jacket. And a shiny vest. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the picture to the left is the EQ basin. You can see the base lab is there and the walls are being formed. And then the picture to the right is Nielsen 3 4. This is the sedimentation basin. And um, that, that's the demo. We actually were there when they were ripping out the handrails with a crane. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was pretty cool. <laughs> um, the Northwest Water Intake Bank Stabilization Project. Um, this project should be completed pretty soon. So um, notice to proceed was November 19th, uh, but there was a material shortage for a while. But um, so the rock veneer has been placed and the geo bags have been installed above and um, the access road repairs have been completed. Does that say, does that say amount spent today? <laughs> they haven't submitted because they had to get the materials in order to be submitting the payout. So, as I said, zero. Yeah. But we'll get the bill. So the picture to the left, you can see, sorry, right, right down here, that's the rock veneers. And then the people, the picture to the right, also have the rock veneers. There's, they sit in front of um, the, mm -hmm. the, oh, main gabion baskets. And then these are the geo bags. So eventually, you see how it's green there? Eventually, it'll fill out with green and it stabilizes a lot more. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, system wide sewer rehab phase four. Uh, this is a, our, well, our system-wide project, obviously, um, our contractor is KRG. We spent about 35% of the contract amount so far, and they're currently working on North Poplar Street and First Street by the past. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have very little sense of direction. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Virginia Road um, has been completed. If you remember, that's the... 1960s house where the sewer was running underneath the building. Um, and we've done approximately 11,160 linear feet of rehab to date. So this is Virginia Road. Um, that manhole is the new manhole. Remember the, I think I showed a picture of, it was a very old brick manhole. It was pretty much gone. Mm -hmm. So that's our new manhole to the left. That's where it's completed to the right. And they're backfilling. Sorry, oh, it's fine. They're getting ready to pay. Kernersville uh, system, the sewer rehab package B. Um, this is approved by commission. Uh, this is, remember, we bid it out as three and we finished package A. So this is package B and C, but we just call it package B now because it's all one contract. So the not notice to proceed was April 1st. And here you can see how much we've completed using the package A. And then package B today, we've done about 2,450 linear feet of pipers. And here is your project map. So the yellow is everything that we did with package A. Um, the red is what, what's left for the package B. And then the purple is what's in progress. And the green is what we've done. Any questions for me? We've been doing a lot of work in, in the current hey, area. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at you yeah. been too long. <laughs> the local newspaper actually each week puts in it what is going to be closed next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's progressing. You keep track of all yeah. of that. Yeah, we'll send you that update. Um, if, can we go back one slide? Yep. So I kind of understand 
these numbers. So when I look at contract time used, 25%, and so that's in between the notice of receipt and the final completion of today. And the amount spent today, so far only 8%. When I'm looking at these numbers, how can I tell if the project is on time? Excellent question. So typically we do the contract time use to be from so like 12-year project or 12-month project. And so we go uh, April, May, mm -hmm. and June. So that's three months. Yeah, so that's 25%. Mm -hmm. Yes. But um it didn't always work out. Yeah. Well. I, I would add that they very rarely match. It's kind of like a bell curve, right? So, well, no, I don't, I understand about amount spent today and contract time used, what those mean. But what I'm saying is, how do I know if we are okay. on schedule? Well, maybe we should just start adding that to the slide and just, and because I'd like to know that based upon. Well, look, if they're uh, if we go six, seven years, we'll let you know. How about that? <laughs> Too late. I won't That's be, a joke. I won't be here. <laughs> so. yeah. Too late. But, but uh, to your point, there's not a good way technically to tell with the amount spent and the contract time because they don't all. It doesn't match up exactly. Well, so maybe we just add a section. Yeah, add something I mean, on there. You know, time. normally. When you you know as you're starting a project, you know what you expect it to be. There's milestones mm -hmm. that you know if you don't have this by a certain time, you're not going to make something else. So you might get some general milestones to let you be able to say this appears to be on schedule. Well, and each one of these might might be different. For example, the, sure. the Swan intake that work we we gave them several months to do it, but a lot of it was just getting their submittals in. Yeah. The actual work only took you know maybe a month. Yeah. So they haven't built us because. They've only been working for four or five weeks. Well, they're going to bill us one time, so it's going to go from zero percent to one hundred percent. Whereas Nielsen, for example, Nielsen, you know, a lot of the big equipment, the you know PLCs, the MCCs, the generators, they haven't come in yet. Those are big ticket items that'll significantly increase that number. I would just like to see if the project is. Yeah, I think we can just add that in. That was it, right? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Nation. Thanks so uh, I guess that brings us to the end of our meeting. Courtney, you got anything else you need to? Uh, well, I did. I did. Um, to hear, I didn't know if you wanted to introduce your new staff in okay. your um, uh, office. I she's. I went around and making introductions at the beginning, and I felt the okay. So go ahead and do that. So good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Jakari Westbrook, and I manage the city of Winston-Salem's Minority and Women Business okay. Enterprise right. Program. Um, and we did have several vacancies within our program. And Gwendolyn Teal um, is a diversity compliance specialist now with our program, and we're so happy to have her. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks good. for good being Good to have you. Here. Welcome. Can you, can you, you tell us something about yourself? Sure. Um, I am from originally from South Florida, North Carolina. Came to Winston Salem via Winston Salem State University. Um, I worked in banking for over ten years and um, wanted to put my efforts more into something a little bit more meaningful when I turned got a little bit older. And um, so, so happy to be here. My husband also works for the city of Winston Salem. So we're all locked in. Good. <laughs> Good. Well, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then the only other person I think that's not normal face, or so I won't put you on the spot, you know. <laughs> so she's uh, um, here because of the prime rank memo, in case you had any questions on that. She's the revenue collector, so um, only makes an appearance probably once a year, right? But anyway, yeah. glad to have her too. <laughs> thank you. Good. Excellent. Well, thank you all for being here, being a part of the team. Certainly, everybody's important, and we, we appreciate that, and especially our interns, because that's our future, mm -hmm. hopefully. Uh -huh. So we'll come back or at least spread the word with somebody you know they've got a good place to work. Um, at this point, I guess, is there anything as far as the for the good of the body from the community? Any comments that anybody here? That, uh, just, you know, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, first yes. of all, welcome everybody. Glad that you all are, are here, part of the city, part of our team now. Uh, in the past, we had concerns and, and, and petitions and complaints that were raised by the residents near one of the waste treat, the water treatment plant. Mm -hmm. 
Is that issue resolved or are they still concerned? Yes, uh, Mr. Younger, I have not heard of um, complaints near, and the ones you're referring to, I think, is the complaints that we received for odor at Elledge. Yeah. At our Elledge wastewater treatment plant. And I have not heard um, any complaints in probably, it might be close to two years. It's been a while because I know it's, it was pre pandemic. So I think. So it's been a while. So we're doing some, whatever we're doing is working. And um, we want to knock on wood. We don't want to talk any, anything up. <laughs> Any other comments for any of the other commissioners? Just to we'll just say thanks. Good deal. Thanks, Alan. Are we selling water to Oak Ridge? Stokesdale? No, not directly, but we do sell to Stokesdale. To Stokesdale. To Stokesdale. Yeah, so they are one of our wholesale customers. Have we sold any to Greensboro? Yes, we. Uh, Greensboro is also um, one of our wholesale customers. So we sell to, to Greensboro um, on a not on a consistent basis, but I'm looking at Bill, maybe it's like once a year, right? Yeah, they, they do an annual burnout usually once a year, or if if they're doing significant work to their Mitchell plant, they'll take that zone out of service and we'll feed them. We'll feed them okay. Yeah, when, when they changed their, their disinfection process years ago, that's when we stopped selling to them routinely in the summertime. And King was building their own water system, right? So King is not one of our water. Well, we have an emergency connect with King, but they're not a, um, it's there um, and they can use it if they need to, but they do have their own water treatment plant that they built. They are a wastewater wholesale customer of us, of ours, um, but they do have plans to build a wastewater treatment plant as well. And in the future would not rely on us to provide those services. And everything with Davy County is just going on okay. Yep, Davy County is um, one of our wholesale customers um, on the wastewater side. And so we treat their, uh, their they send us their waste and we treat it at our Money Creek plant. You know, it might, it might be a good idea. Maybe that's one of the topics that I share just to update you on our wholesale customers because we are Winston Salem Forsyth County Utilities and we serve majority of Forsyth County, but it, we need to remind people that we do branch out, we do serve. We're a regional utility and we do serve um, outside the county as well. So I can bring you that information. Yeah. Great. Anything else from any of the other commissioners? That being said, I'm ready for. I do have my automatic monitoring in for the. Oh, surprise. Oh, automatic monitoring for the surprise. Well, it was a surprise to get hit by water. So that's not... your meter? Yeah. Oh, he's got his AMI meter in. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's yeah. one so of our new AMI customers. So you like it? AMI meter in. You like it? Is it working good? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but they were meticulous okay. about putting it in, too. Which okay. I thought was really interesting. Well, good. maybe maybe special customers. Maybe yes. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to figure out how everything works now and how to get on, you know, all that right now. So, yeah. Okay, good. But, well, that's so I get the experience at that. That's right. You can report back. That's yes. right. You're our you're our example customer. There you go. <laughs> well, that being said, if there's nothing else from the commissioners, I appreciate your time. We're almost at two, so I will entertain a motion for a journal dismissal. We don't have hair on here, so somebody's got to go. Ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I'll make a motion Roll. to it. Let's leave. <laughs> All right. Second <laughs> motion made. Second, Second by. Uh, so is uh, all, oh, roll call. Roll call, yeah. Commissioner Bonhaus? Yes. Commissioner Hugh Jernigan? Yes. Commissioner Dwayne Long? Yes. Commissioner Chris Parker? Yes. Commissioner Charles Wilson? Yes. Commissioner Alan Younger? No. <laughs> no, 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 no,